I'm going to give you the <clears throat> kind of the theme this year. We're talking about, re, we're talking about re, reclaiming surrendered ground, but I'm going to wrap up this concept of, of gratitude, really. Um, I think it's all attached. I think the reason sometimes we're not grateful is because we've surrendered ground. Anyway, so I'll, I'll tie all this together as we go through it. <clears throat> but the title of the day is The, the Key to Everything. I want to read a passage to you out of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. I use this every couple of years in this, in this series. <clears throat> uh, Paul is talking to Timothy. Timothy's going to begin his ministry. Verse 17, he's saying to Timothy, here's what you should be doing. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is, uh, which is so uncertain, but they're put to hope in God, who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. Now, anytime you're reading something in Scripture, make sure you understand in context. Okay, so sometimes somebody will quote a verse. The verse is good or whatever. It says whatever they want it to say. But it's not just important what the verse says, but it's important what the verse says in the context. Okay? So in the context, Paul is talking to Timothy about uh, people who um, love money, who are striving to be wealthy. That's what he's talking about. Uh, and, and really, in the context, he's also talking about people who, uh, for the sake of the gospel, are trying to be wealthy. And so he's just saying to Timothy, don't do this. Don't be like these people, but in command others to do it this way. So let me go back to verse 6. This is the same, same chapter, chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness and contentment are a great gain. For we brought nothing to this world, we take nothing out of it, but we have food and clothing, and we'll be content with that. Those who want... And this is really the context, he's, he's, verse 9 and 10 is where he's, really the context of what he's come to. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The, the key phrase is those who want to get rich. It has nothing to do with money. Money's not even a conversation, really. It's about the attitude about money. It goes on verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, money's, that's, money is not the root of evil. The love of money is. <laughs> and it's not really just about money. It's about all kinds of um, material possessions. That in their day, Paul thought he was talking to a culture that was um, materialistic. Well, that culture would have been materialistic in their day, but nothing compared to what our culture is today. I mean, our culture is extraordinarily materialistic. And that's just the way that's, the, that's become normal for us. Well, that's, you know, that's what he's really addressing here. It's not that someone has money or that someone makes money or that someone has, has managed their money well and therefore they have you know, excess money. That's not the conversation. The conversation is it's the love of money or the love of material possessions. It's the love of having more than what we need. It's the, because it never ends. You never, you never get enough. It's just gotta have more, gotta have more, gotta have more. And this point is that leads us down a path of other things. Uh, it comes on, you know, verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money. Either, again, the word money in the passage is not just talking about cash. Because they didn't, their culture wasn't like our culture with cash. It's, they had money, you know, cash, but they, they it, it was about possessions. You know, how many goats do you have? How many camels do you have? How many oxen do you have? How many, that, it was all about that kind of stuff too. So it's all of things we call material possessions. Um, and some have, some have even eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, if you just process for a second, okay? I'm not trying to get, this is not reading the passage for today, per se, but just process for a second and think about the things that the love of money has cost you. Love of trying to get more things, more material things. One of the, the number one financial, the number one stressor in a marriage, just routinely year after year after year after year, is finances. Debt, the stress that comes with those kind of things. Because we, we, ha we have to have it now, we have to buy it in debt instead of waiting and being more patient or, you know, that instant gratification thing. That's, 
a love of material possession. That's instant gratification. I got to have it. I got to buy bigger and better and nicer and cooler and more and whatever. And, and that's what he's talking. That's why he's addressing. Okay. Now I'll come back to that a little bit later. So let's go back to verse 17. Now he's saying, okay, don't be like that. It's not the love of money. Don't get caught up in the love of money. All right. But, you know, love godliness, love righteousness, that kind of thing. Verse 17, and command those who are rich, not those who love money, but those who already have, they have possessions, they have stuff, right? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant and to put their hope in wealth. Because one of the things that comes with having stuff is we put our hope in stuff. I got stuff, I'm good. And I, I use an illustration of churches sometimes. A church that doesn't have a lot, and our church, we, you know, it's like we have a lot of stuff. And um, we, you know, um, we, don't have any, we don't have any money. We're not, you know, we just got stuff. And uh, uh, we have to live by faith. I mean, any given week, I mean, our giving, like a couple weeks ago, our giving was down like three weeks in a row. It's like, woo, Shoo, boys, hell, oh, oh. It gets rough around here. Well, church has millions of dollars in the bank. And there's churches that do. They don't have to have faith. Now, I'm not trying to say we're all spending all our money so we don't have faith, we don't have reserves, that kind of stuff. That's not the conversation. But what happens is if I as a person have a lot, God has, to, for me to have faith... God is going to challenge our faith. That's that faith grows by being stretched. It's like a muscle. Like my muscles are sore today because I did a lot of yard work yesterday. And, you know, so that's halfway squatting thing where you just got constant tension on your hammies and you're kind of halfway bending over and on my back. And so I got some sore spots because it's things I didn't normally do. And it's because they were exercised yesterday. Well, faith is the same way. Faith is, for faith to be stretched or to grow, it, or to grow, it has to be stretched. It has to be put under pressure. Well, how does God put us under pressure if we have everything we want? If we, if we make those vows, we'll come back to this in a few weeks now, but we'll talk about it a few weeks ago. If we make vows that I don't have, enough, I'm not going to do, I can't have time, I don't have whatever it is. We make these, these, these vows that say, I'm not going to follow God that direction. I won't take my next step of whatever it is because I don't want to be stretched. How does God grow our faith? If our faith isn't growing, what happens to us? If there aren't works, deeds, activities that back up our faith, what is, what is really taking place? And so what he's saying is he's addressing people in verse 17 that say, what, these people who put their hope in their, in their wealth and their possessions rather than in God, they're doing it backwards. And the American church is full of that. The church itself can be full of that. It's in the organization. When you have a lot of stuff, it's easy to think we got plenty. We don't need to, we're not going to put ourselves under pressure. We're not going to allow God to stretch us. We're not going to allow God to ask us of things that, that you know, we don't seem easy for us. And the moment we take that attitude as an individual, as a church, then we're going to slide in the places God don't want us to go to. And what he's saying is, is that God is the one who gives. He gives to everyone. Matter of fact, Psalms 24, verse, chapter 24, verse 1 will say that, that everything in the world belongs to God, that everything is his. So how biblical stewardship goes is that I am a steward of all that God has entrusted to me. My next breath, finances, you know, we're talking about the word stewardship. It's more, way more than finances. It's everything, how you spend your time. Your relationships, your children, uh, men, your wife is something you're a steward of. My manager. God's entrusted someone to you. Wives, your husband, someone God's entrusted to you. Parents, your children, people God's entrusted to you. That everything we have is a gift from God. That we are expected by God to be stewards of that. And the more that God's entrusted to us is the more he asks of us. The higher the expectations. The, the more we're accountable. That if you've been entrusted with much, you're, whoever's been entrusted with something, is, it's required they must prove faithful. 
we'll be held accountable to everything God's entrusted to us. I mean, it's a huge responsibility, but we don't want to think about that because we want to go out and have fun. But at the end of the day, there's paydays coming. There's a day we're going to have to stand up and say, okay, <clears throat> remember the old, uh, was it Midas commercial? They used to pay me now, pay me later, that, that commercial. We're, we're going to pay eventually. We're going to be judged eventually. At some point in time, we have to stand up and face God and say, okay, you've, God's going to say, I entrusted you with this. What did you do with that? Did you use it for your own pleasure? Your own glory? Your own pride? Your own comfort? Or did you allow me to do these things in and through you? Did you invest it for my kingdom's sake? I mean, that's, at the end of the day, we all have to face that at some point in time. I mean, if we do right things, I mean, if I do a right thing for my glory, for my credit, so people like me more, th that's not what God wants me to do. It's not do the right thing so that God so that the person, the individual, or the church gets credit for it. It's you do the right thing because God asks you to for his glory. It's, some of it's just mindset, some of it's attitude, some of it's perception. But at the end of the day, God knows. And we just think for a second, um, and this theme will come out throughout this time frame, this next few weeks probably, but at the end of the day, we get the results we want. We do what we want to do. We do it the way we want to do it most of the time. I don't want to do that, therefore I don't. A marriage. A marriage will be as healthy and as happy as two individuals want to be. Or marriage can be as stressful and as conflict-ridden as two individuals want to be. Our relationship with God can be as, what are the word you want to use, tight, as faithful, as, what are the word you want to use, as we want to be. God's drawing us into a deeper relationship with him constantly. For some of us, we don't know Christ our Savior yet. He's drawing you a relationship. Some of you know Christ your Savior for a long time, but you're dead and you're stagnant in your relationship with him. He's drawing you a deeper relationship with him. Your spiritual development is the most important thing in the world. It's more important than anything about your life because it affects everything. It's, it's seeking first God and his way of doing things affects every single thing we do. We'll be a better dad, a better husband, a better father, a better employer and better employee, better mom, better wife, better. Well, everything will be better if we do things God's way. It's that kind of a concept, right? But what happens is, well, I, you know, I'm just going to go to church. If, if that's the expectation, I'm just going to go to church. I'm good. I, 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 I get a gold star. I went to church today. That's it. If that's the attitude we have, then that's the relationship we have with God. God wants more. He wants more from each of us. Now, it's not, well, Tim's the pastor of the church. It has nothing to do with it. Being the pastor of the church just means that I have some responsibilities that someone who's not the pastor doesn't have. But as a follower of Christ, it's all the same. The, 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 the biblical concept is a priest, what we call the priesthood of believers, is that we're all ministers. We are, we, once you receive Christ, he's the, he's the head, he's the chief priest, right? And he gives us direct access to God. And the spirit of God indwells us. And the Spirit of God wants to transform us from the inside out to make us the, the people he's called us to be, to, to do the things that he's called us to do, that, that list of good works that we were born with. I mean, it, it, was, it, was on, it was like on the refrigerator of God was this list of things he wanted to accomplish in your life before you were ever born. He gave you the gift and the calling to do those things. You may just be waking up to that idea, but God knew it from the time you, before you were born, God knew. And then what we do is we, we end up spending our life serving us. You know, our stuff and our needs and our whatever it is, and we don't have, it's not, hey, it's not that we have things and that we spend time on stuff. We spend money on stuff. That has nothing to do with it. Here's where the problem comes in. If this is me and God asked me for a next step, if God is stirring my heart to somehow respond to him and I can't do it, because of me. 
I've made a vow. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough experience. Whatever the thing is, I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. That is the problem. The vow we've made that says we, don't, we can't somehow take the next step, that's the problem. So, if God says, Tim, give $10, and I say, I can't, I don't have enough, that's the problem. I'm spending my stuff on me rather than putting God in his proper respect, in his proper place of first place, recognizing he is the giver of all things, and my job is to manage what he's entrusted to me the way he wants me to. God asked me for 10 minutes of time. I can't, I don't have enough time. God's entrusted to me a a 24-hour day and I don't have time to respond to him the way he asked me to. God says, I want you to make this decision. I want you to make this step that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. I know, I know this is going to stretch you, Tim, but how you get experience in doing things is doing things the first time. So I'm asking you to step out and do this and trust me in this and do the thing that I'm asking you to do. And I, well, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I've never done that. I, I feel awkward. I don't want to look like a fool. I'm not going to do that, God. See, that's the problem. It's, a, it's the thing that, sa- that I use to say, it's mine, I don't have to obey you. Now just stop, talk time for a second, make you the owner of a company. And you say to an employer or employee, hey, I need you to do this. And they say, I don't want to. They get fired. Is that correct? I mean, let's say your company says, hey, we're all going to wear a uniform and you buy your own uniform. The guy said, I don't want to. I don't have enough money. Okay, well, then you don't work here anymore. Hey, I want you to sh- stay a little later, show up a little earlier. I want you to do this thing. I don't have time for that. Oh, okay, you don't work here anymore. Well, uh, I want you to try this new thing. I'm going to put you in this new area that we want to try. Well, that makes you feel uncomfortable. I don't know if I want to do that or not. Well, then you get fired. You don't work here anymore. We are lazy employees who deserve to be fired as it relates to our relationship with God most of the time. If God is the boss, he's Lord of our life. He is leader. He's not just our savior. He's supposed to be Lord. If God is the boss, then we are the employees. If God is the father, we are his children. Ever, ever, what illustration you want to use, God's at the top and we're somewhere below that. The question is, when God stirs us, when God draws us, when God calls us, whatever the word you want to use is, how do we respond to him? As obedient children? As obedient employees? I mean, pick the word, whatever phrase makes sense to you. Or do we want to put our hope in our stuff? in our way of doing things, in what we think is right. We've got it all backwards. Lord doesn't mean there's a debate. There's not a vote. There's not a, God says to the church, hey, church, I want you guys to do X, Y, Z. And say, hang on, hang on just a second, God, we got to vote because we're d- democratic around here, so let's vote. Well, God, we vote against you. You lost. You think, how do you think? The church, technically, by the way, is a theocracy. It's not a democracy. All that church voting on stuff thing is fine. It relates to what God's will is. But the moment the the, the democracy outvotes God, it's wrong. The church is a theocracy. God, Christ is the head of the church. Okay? Anyway, different conversation. But it happens all the time. So at the church level, okay, I can see that. Well, what about at my personal level? God, God says, Tim, take this next step. Tim, respond to me this way. Tim, serve me. Repent from this. Change this. Start doing this. Respond to this need. I ain't got time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. I don't really want to do that. I'm feeling apathetic today. I'm just really busy, God. You don't understand. The moment I outvote God, I'm wrong. There isn't a vote. It's not a debate. It's, it's not if you have three children that you say, take out the trash. They get to vote on it and come back and say, hey, dad, sorry. We voted two to one not to take out the trash today. What? <laughs> it, that's why he's really addressing in chapter seven, or verse 17 when he says, 
Tell them not to be arrogant. Tell them not to put their hope in their stuff, but rather put their hope in God who gives everything for, and this is the best part of it, for their enjoyment. God wants you to enjoy things. The creator wants you to enjoy the created, but he doesn't want you to worship the created. He don't want you to put the created above him as the creator. Number one, the outline. I'll give you number one and two because I've been beating them up all, already pretty good. Number one, where we place our hope matters. Where we place our hope matters. In every relationship, by the way, it's not just hope. And let's talk about, I haven't mentioned marriage. Well, let's talk about marriage again. Um, is my hope in Christ or is my hope in my spouse? See, the series, I may use the word stewardship. It's not about money. It's about everything. Time, energy, relationships, everything, right? And money. If I put my hope in my spouse, what happens when my spouse misses my expectations? And then what happens? Then we try to fix our spouses. We're going to, and we may play games, play cold shoulder games, you know, or we get, maybe we get mad and slam doors. Maybe we don't return phone calls or we hang up on phone calls. You know, whatever the games are. Don't nudge people, but just, you know. Right? What about if we just quit having the expectations of our spouses and we started just trusting God? Maybe we ought to pray for our spouses rather than argue with our spouses. I mean, what would happen if you spent as much time praying for your marriage as you did arguing with the person you're married to? And what if God fixed them if it was God fixed me? I mean, what if the thing that God's wanting to work on me, see, let's just say there's a thing about me. Say I'm impatient, okay? And maybe my spouse pushes the buttons, or maybe it's my kids, or maybe it's my parents, okay? They push the buttons of my impatience because they're always running late, or they're always whatever the thing is, and so it's, they're constantly pushing my buttons. Maybe it's not that God can't fix that, but maybe what God's want to do is, Tim, I need to address your impatience because patience is a fruit, is a gift, a fruit of the Spirit. It's an evidence of the Holy Spirit. Your impatience is an evidence of your flesh being in control. It's not that my flesh isn't impatient, but the Spirit of God should override this. When I feel my impatient button being pushed, I need to choose impatience, flesh, or patience, spirit. Maybe what God's trying to do is sandpaper off some rough edges in me, and the person I live with exposes those. Well, I want to get angry at them because they're pushing a button, they're exposing an area of pain in my life. Well, who, who gets the credit? Who, that's, that's, who gets joy when that all happens? It's the enemy. It's Satan himself. Because we're not addressing God now. Now we're addressing each other. And my frustration with them because they X, Y, Z. Well, when you attack someone else's, whatever they did to you, what do they do? They come back at you with what you did to them. Well... You, you know, whatever the impatient thing is. Well, they come back and say, well, yeah, but you spent too, too much money, you know, at the hardware store. It, it goes back and forth, right? Who gets credit? Who gets glory? Who's giggling? Is Satan giggling? See, this, this stewardship thing applies to all areas. And we put our, we put our hope, our expectations, in where it's our wealth, our stuff, or it's in our spouse, or it's in our kids, or it's in our parents, or it's in our employer, or it's in our employees, or pick the topic. We put our hope in blank. Our expectations are on whatever it is. And what happens when it's gone? You've always been healthy. Yes. What happens when you're not healthy? What happens when all of a sudden sickness, disease hits? What happens when all of a sudden you've always had some cash flow and what happens when all of a sudden the cash flow for whatever reason stops see 
if you just process that for a while, and you may have to think about it for hours or maybe days, what are all the things you put your hope in before you put your hope in Christ? My kids are well-behaved. It's easy to put your hope in your kids and them being well-behaved rather than putting your hope in God still. See, if your kids are losing their minds and making bad decisions, now you're going to pray about it, right? What about before then? What about being the godly father that God called you to be? Or the godly mom God called you to be? And praying for your kids. Number two, biblical uh, biblical stewardship means God is the owner and giver, and we are the managers. The God is the owner and giver, and we're the managers. And that's the owner and giver of everything. The owner and giver of everything. Um, It goes on in verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and generous and willing to share. And he's not, again, he's not, he's not saying anti-money, anything. But he's saying we ought to be wealthy in our good deeds. Number three in the outline, deeds don't save, but faith without deeds is dead. Deeds don't save. But faith without deeds is dead. All right, so just make sure everybody understands. I'm going to get your theology messed up. Um, We're not saved by our works, our deeds. The Bible says very clearly we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of deeds. Okay? Don't get that confused. However, if salvation has occurred... There should be deeds that evidence the salvation. Okay? So if I am saved, there ought to be good works, deeds that show that, that evidence that. So in James, I put some scriptures now, you can look them up later. In James, it, it, that's what it addresses. It says, because they're talking about two different audiences. One's talking about, and Paul's talking about the Ephesians, the churches, or the people who felt like that their good works saved them. And he's saying, you're not saved by your good works. Your righteousness is filthy rags to God. It's God giving you his righteousness in Christ that saves you and all that kind of stuff, right? So you're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Any denomination, preacher, anybody who tells you you're saved by your works is lying, is not biblical, is not true. However, if you really are saved, if you say you believe on Christ, you're saved. You know, we talk about believing. You believe in your heart, believe in your mind, right? To be saved really requires believing. That's all it requires, That you believe you have faith in God and receive his grace. That's it. But if you believe in your head, that's about believing facts. You can pass a test on a a test. But believing your heart should transform you to a place that there's good works, there's deeds that back that up. And that's that's what James is addressing. James is addressing people who thought, hey, I believe in God. And he's saying stuff like, well, yeah, the demons believe. Being a demon who believes in Christ does not get you saved, get you into heaven. The demons believe in God. They tremble at that. that believing is not what saves you. It, it, believing is what saves you. But it's believing in your heart, not your head. And he says, and James, so if, you're, if you have faith, then there should be good works that match that. If you don't have good works that match your faith, your faith is dead. What he's saying is you never receive Christ your Savior. You're never saved if you don't have deeds that back that up. We have, uh, I could just be, I could have moved here this week and, um, and I see a, a field that has the corn has been harvested. I can surmise based on the fact that there has been corn harvested in that field. I can guarantee you without any fear at all being wrong. I wasn't here, but I guarantee you that last spring, a farmer planted seed in that field. How do I know that? Now, just because you see a field in the spring that's been, that looks nice and black, right? Dirt, that, that looks, that's beautiful, that's great. It don't mean there's any seed in the ground. 
Just because a tractor's been driving across of it with pulling an implement behind it doesn't mean there's any seed in the ground. They could be faking. Right? Just going through the motions. Ain't no seed in the planter. We're just kind of driving. Well, that's how some of us live our Christian life. How do you know you know Christ your Savior? How do you know if your life ends right now that you sin turning in heaven with God rather than turning in hell separated from God? How do you know? There's deeds. So in the corn world, there's seed that's planted in the spring. How do we know it's planted? Well, when you see green things start to come out of the ground. That's how we know. That's what James is saying. Your faith, you tell me you have faith in God, you tell me you believe in Christ, you tell me you're saved. If there's not good works that back that up, if there's not the evidence of the Spirit of God working in you, changing you from the inside out, if there's not evidence of the activity of God in your life, then you're not saved. You don't know him as your Savior. Your faith is dead. That's what James is saying. Number four in the outline, it comes out of verse 18, 18 also. The key to everything is generosity motivated by gratitude. And this is really going to be the theme. And we're going to talk about how to reclaim surrendered ground. Because I think a part of the problem in our world is we just surrender so much. Individually as churches What Paul says, how he says in verse 18, again, uh, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds. And it says, and generous and willing to share. Here's what the idea, if you understand the Greek words in there, here's what the idea behind that is. Because I am so grateful for all that God has done for me, that all that God has given me, I will be generous. Generosity reflects the heart of God. You'll hear me say that a lot. Generosity reflects the heart of God. God so loved the world, he gave. That every dime that comes through our checking accounts, God gave. Our talents, our abilities, our opportunities. Now, I made myself this way. Biblically, what? That makes us arrogant to think that. I did this all on my own. That's arrogant to say that. You didn't do anything on your own. And don't push God's buttons because he can take it away in a second, whatever it is. It's not about you, I, us, our pride. Make a name for ourselves. It's about God. It's his glory. It's his plan. It's his intention. It's what he's trying to accomplish in and through us that matters. That's the whole point. It's about him. Forgiveness. The Bible says we're supposed to forgive others as God has forgiven us. Why should I forgive someone? When I talk about forgiveness sometimes, I do a whole series on forgiveness, right? And talk about how, you know, forgiveness isn't for them, it's for us, and all that kind of stuff. But in the general concept, here's what forgiveness is. I don't have to want to forgive you, but I should, because I'm so grateful, grateful for what God has given me or forgiven me of, I should be generous with my forgiveness to others. Kindness. What's kindness? Just be, you know. What is that? It's, it's, it's being generous. It's not with the finances. Don't hear the word finances when you hear generosity. It's way more than that. You can be stingy in lots of ways. You can be greedy in lots of ways. All right? You can be greedy with forgiveness or stingy with forgiveness, right? You can be greedy or stingy with attitudes like kindness. I'm not going to be nice to them. What? That, 
Listen, if you know, if, it, when the Bible says that we should, we should treat others as we want to be treated, that's kind of what it's saying. It's because we want people to treat us with kindness. We should treat others with kindness. Well, I don't want to. Okay. Well, you don't understand. I, I'm just a, um, um, you know, I've just been hurt by too many people. Okay. What? what? Okay. I'm, I'm not saying those things aren't true. But what does God say? What does the Bible say? If, if God is the boss, if he's Lord, how do I evidence that? See, the key to everything, I don't care what we're talking about. Name the thing. Marriage, uh, going to high school, um, owning a business, working at a business, going to church, following Christ, uh, sharing your faith. Pick the topic. Spiritual things, relational things, financial things, emotional things, internal things, external things, any topic you want to pick. The key to everything is generosity that's motivated by gratitude. Not just generosity. I can be generous because I want you to like me. Like we have politicians in this day right now where they're being generous, let's say, because they want us to vote for them on November 6th. Right? If I'm generous because I want you to do something for me, that's not being generous. That's called manipulation. I'm going to be nice to you so you do something for me. I'm going to do whatever for you so you do whatever. For, that is, you know, I'll, be, I'll, I'll obey God so God does something for me. If I take my next step, then I'm sure God will bless me. Okay. Well, yeah, he will. But if that's the reason you do it, that's not generosity at all. That's manipulation. That's a game. See, the key to everything isn't manipulation. It isn't some kind of game we play. It's having a heart of gratitude that motivates us to be generous with everything. God asked me to do something. I don't have enough time. Yeah, but it's God. Okay, think about it this way. Uh, you're busy. You ain't got enough time. Don't you have that person that if they call you, and they say, I need something, you'll drop whatever it is you're doing and go help them? You, are you tracking with me? Right? It doesn't matter what's going on. You'll stop it and go because of who they are to you, of how important they are to you. That's how we ought to be with God. That whatever God stirs in us, the next step he's asking the step of obedience, the step of surrender, the step of whatever, our attitude ought to be so grateful. If, we're, if our mind is right, if we recognize that all that God has done, that if, you, if you just go back to the cross, if you just go back to you know, what God did, you know, the first song we sang, he took all of our sin, he hung on a cross in Christ. If you just go back to that one thing and say, how, how valuable is that to you? I mean, how important is it that your sin is forgiven and you have a relationship with God there because of that? How important is that? Is it, is it worth your 10 minutes or your $10 or your 10 whatever? Is it, worth, is it worth that stretching? It should be. And if it is, then it's like, God, based, I don't want to do this. I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't have energy. I, I feel uncomfortable, whatever the word is. I don't want to do this. But if, if you think about it right, because of who God is and what he's done for me. How can I say no? We've all done things we didn't want to do because of the person who asked us. Why wouldn't we be that way with our Heavenly Father? That really is the whole point of the series. After all God's asked or done for me, how can I say no? It's arrogant for me to say no. And what's happened is, is the enemy has stolen a lot of ground from us.
as individuals, as families, as churches. Because we haven't placed God in his proper position. He's manipulated our emotions. He's manipulated our energy. He's manipulated our time. He's manipulated the way we spend our finances. And we say yes to every single thing before we want to say yes to God. That's what we're we'll talking about. Is how do we reclaim the ground we've surrendered? Whether it be in our time or our, our finances, some areas of obedience, some areas of addiction, some areas of behavior, our relationships. Because at the end of the day, it's about God being who He is and us choosing to surrender to Him as His children. As he's Lord, and we're servants. He's Savior. We're sinners in need of a Savior. He's the provider, and he gives to us everything we need for our enjoyment. So when he asks for something back, how can we say anything but Yes. Let's pray. Father, if we just put our relationship with you in that one, the context of that one question, after all you've done for us, how can we do anything but say yes? Okay, that resolves a lot of questions. When you ask to take a next step of obedience, when you ask us to choose surrender in an area, when you ask us to obey and respond in an area, it's so easy to argue when we think selfishly, when we think about our kingdom. But God, when we think about what you've done and who you are, God, make us more grateful. God, for some of us, maybe we need to be reminded of our sin. Maybe we need to be reminded of where you brought us from or where we struggle at today and how you still give us unconditional love. Father, thank you for your patience when we're impatient. Thank you for your grace when we don't want to give it to others. Thank you for your forgiveness when we struggle sometimes with forgiving others. God, thank you for providing for us and financially and all these other ways when sometimes we're stingy with what you've given us and we don't want to give it back to you. Father, I pray you speak to us where we are the way you want to for your glories. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.